Today, we're going to work our core, so get ready to sweat. Oops, sorry, wrong core. Hey, we've traveled far and wide, down to the Earth's inner core and up into outer space. But what if we could combine these adventures and find out what hides in the innards of other planets and moons in the solar system? With the help of this interstellar hyperdrill, we can achieve that, at least in part. Coordinates are in, all systems ready, and our first destination is… the moon. Our moon, in fact. We land on its gray and desolate surface under the black sky. No blue here, because there's very little atmosphere to disperse the light. The drill starts working, and we first go through the outer layer of the moon, the crust, just like on Earth. We're on the sunny side, so the thickness of this layer is only 43 miles. But were we to land on the dark side, it would be more than twice as thick. The moon is a rocky body, so its crust is largely made of silicon, iron, aluminum, calcium, oxygen, and magnesium, with much smaller amounts of other elements. Further down, we find the mantle, and it's a long and tenuous journey through. This layer is about 850 miles thick. It gets hotter as we go deeper, finding composite minerals, peroxine and olivine. They're made of iron, silicon, oxygen, and magnesium in different proportions. Finally, we break through the hard layers and into the semi-molten outer core. Another journey of about 93 miles ahead through this scalding swamp. And we dive into the iron ocean of the liquid core shell. It's nearly 60 miles thick, and the molten metal threatens to evaporate us. But this drill was made to sustain an extremely heavy onslaught. And that's how we finally come to a sudden halt. In the deepest reaches of the moon, there's a solid iron core, which is 150 miles thick. We could drill through it, but it would be unnecessary. So we just set the flag here and skip to the next planet on our drilling list. And it's Mercury! It was hot deep inside the moon, but on the surface of the smallest planet in the system, it's even hotter. That's because it's so close to the sun, of course. Alright, let's drill. Mercury has a pretty thick outer shell, which is both crust and mantle, going about 250 miles deep. Not the most fascinating journey, it's not unlike the Earth in many respects. But then, the drill stops, ramming into a solid metal wall. It's Mercury's core, which has a diameter of over 2,500 miles. It takes up to 85% of the planet's overall diameter. No use trying to drill through this one, it's fully metal and extremely dense. Skipping to the next planet, and we're on Mars now. Oh look, it's sunset here, and the sun is making the sky hazy blue. But you know the drill. I mean, we're here to drill. So that's what we do. Mars' crust is quite thin compared to Earth's, just 6 to 30 miles deep. Its composition is much the same, though. Iron, aluminum, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. That's one of the reasons why humans are looking to colonize the red planet one day. It's very similar to our own. We're very quick to drill through the first layer, and the second one, the mantle, is now upon us. It's a hard and rocky layer about 1,100 miles thick. Thanks to its size, Mars isn't seismically active any longer. There's simply no magma boiling close underneath the surface of the planet, making it silent and docile. It's a long dig, but we finally come to a screeching halt, bumping into the core. A ball of iron, nickel, and sulfur with a diameter of 2,000 to 2,600 miles. This core is bigger than that of Mercury, but the planet itself is larger too, so it figures. Okay then, our next stop is even more interesting, because it's… Jupiter. This gas giant has a mass twice that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. And we landed right in the middle of an ocean. The ocean, I dare say, it's the largest one in the whole system, and it's made of liquid hydrogen. The drill goes smoothly through the surface of the planet because there's no rock or hard metal here, only gas and liquid. But the shaking, yikes! The pressure on this planet is more than just huge, it's unimaginable. The drill is barely able to withstand it, and as it's going deeper, the pressure's becoming higher too. We've reached Jupiter's core, and it's nearly too much to bear. The temperature here is about 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the core itself is not solid but liquid as well, kept together by the immense pressure from all sides. The drill starts to rattle. Bad sign. Let's get out of here before it breaks. Whew! 
No winds, no pressure, no heat. All around us is a vast, icy wasteland, crisscrossed by ridges and reddish bands. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's most promising moons. As we drill through the ice, let me explain. Europa is one of the candidates to have extraterrestrial life in the solar system, and it can be found right beneath the icy shell through which we're now digging. It's only 10 to 15 miles thick, while down below is an enormous saltwater ocean, twice bigger than all of Earth's oceans combined. The deepest point on Earth is Challenger Deep, and it's a bit over 6 miles down. The ocean on Europa, on the other hand, can be up to 100 miles deep. Who knows what can be lurking in that deep, dark sea? Anyway, we travel fast through the water and finally reach the bottom of the ocean. The mantle starts here, and it's made of rock, just like on Earth. And not much deeper in, we find the metal core of the moon. Europa is a little smaller than Earth's moon, so it's no surprise we reach its center pretty fast. Okay, skip drive on, let's go further. Oh, I'd rather we drill in as fast as we can. Just look around, it's blazing here. We're definitely on Io, another moon of Jupiter, and the most volcanically active world in the solar system. Look, that volcano is twice the size of Everest, and it's erupting right now. Thankfully, we're under Io's surface already. But that's not to say we're safe. It's all molten down here too, mostly yellow and brownish hue, due to the huge amounts of sulfur. The stench must be horrible. Anyway, the most peculiar feature is that both inside and outside, everything's always on the move on Io. Jupiter and its other moons create tremendous tidal forces, making the surface of Io swell over 300 feet up and down. Like the largest tsunamis on Earth, only here it's not water, but rock. The deeper we go, the calmer it gets, though, until we're finally at the iron core. It's still hot here, but at least there's no shaking and swelling like above. Let's put up another flag and go to the next point. And that would be Saturn! the second largest planet of the solar system, and the one best known for its spectacular rings. Not the only one to have them at all, mind you, but we'll get to it. Now, as you've surely noticed, our drill is simply falling down through the gaseous hydrogen and helium, making up most of the planet's surface and atmosphere. No need to work here, just wait and hope the immense pressure won't crush our drill to a hunk of junk. At last, the pressures become so enormous that we find ourselves in the liquid hydrogen, and here we start diving. Soon we'll reach the solid core of Saturn. Ah, here we are. It's made of iron and nickel and is actually quite small compared to the rest of the planet. Well, the last destination awaits, so come on! And here we come, Neptune. The drill immediately deploys anchors, because the winds here are extremely powerful. They reach speeds five times greater than the most devastating hurricanes on Earth. Neptune is covered in a pretty thin layer of hydrogen and helium, just like Saturn or Jupiter. But underneath, there's much more than that. It's hot, windy, and lonely here on the outskirts of the solar system. So let's dig already. Beneath the gases, there's suddenly a bubbling hot mass of water, methane, and ammonia. Pew! These substances are hot, despite Neptune being called an ice giant. The name comes from its core. Deep inside, where we're quickly headed right now, a small ball of rock and ice sits all alone. And despite the boiling temperatures above, the ice beneath is ever cold. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon, or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury. And right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. And then, in the blink of an eye, you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock. 
Those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful, it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that, because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile-thick crust. Then you spot bright burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. Thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time the view is different. 
Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. The explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The Sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful, gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding, and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart, sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. The largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. You see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter, that's liquid hydrogen, that later turns metallic. And finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the water ammonia ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core made up of iron and other metals. Soaring temperatures of more than 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, solid rocks of blazing superhot fire, immense pressures 3.5 million times stronger than on the surface of the Earth. These are just some of the things cooking 1,800 miles beneath your feet as you're watching this video. How? The sun is burning with a temperature similar to our planet's core, but it's 93 million miles away. So why isn't Earth melting away from its own core? Our little blue planet is made of many layers stacked one upon another. The inner core, the outer one, the mantle, and the crust. 
The deeper you go, the hotter and more pressurized it gets. Plate tectonics are layers of the mantle and crust piggyback riding, forever moving, and just having a good time. Scientists discovered there are nine plates in total in different parts of the world. When these plates move and grind on each other, earthquakes occur. Energy is released as a result, and we feel it on the surface. Think of it as trying to shut a car door after stuffing it to the brim. When you realize there's something in the way, remove it, and boom, everything topples. Billions of years ago, our lands were all interlocked in what was called Pangaea. But slowly, and I mean slowly, over the years, the continents drifted apart into what we have right now. The Earth was also cooler on the inside, but it slowly started generating more heat in the core. Earthquakes are measured with intensity and magnitude. We see how far the effects of an earthquake reach through magnitude, and the intensity is the measure of its power. Over at the mantle, the cooler rocks begin sinking, and hot material from the core rises up. When this happens, the plates begin moving, and as a result, they create mountains, hills, and bodies of water we have today. None of these things happen overnight. It takes millions of years to actually see something. All the way in the layers of the Earth, there are different sources of heat, mainly from when the planet was initially formed. Friction heating occurs when materials begin sinking down to the center of the Earth. Since the Earth is surrounded by a solid mantle, the crust floating on top of it acts as a barrier to protect us from the Earth's insides. But the secret for its success is the difference between heat and temperature. Simply put, heat is just energy, and temperature is its density. If the Sun was 1,800 miles away from the surface of the Earth and boiling at the same temperature as our core, we would melt like ice cream on a hot sunny day. A shock from a small short circuit when plugging out your phone charger from the socket won't be too harmful, even though a spark can have temperatures of around 2,700 degrees. But if you dipped your body in a boiling bath of hot water at around 200 degrees, let's just say it's not worth it. Just because the temperature of the sun's surface is roughly the same as the Earth's core doesn't mean the heat distribution is the same. The Earth's core is teeming with iron throughout the layers. But on the surface, the iron atoms are arranged into cube shapes. That's when iron is in normal room temperature and regular pressure. But put in extreme conditions, the atomic shape changes into hexagons. For a long time, scientists thought that the iron in the core was hexagon-shaped. But they found out it retained its cubic formation 1,800 miles underground. Since the core has so much pressure, the atoms simply don't have a place to move to change their shape. If you were standing in a subway train that was packed full, you wouldn't even have space to lift your arm. But everyone inside is able to switch positions while keeping the original shape. That's why the structure of the Earth's core is solid and not liquid. The atoms are so tightly packed that they can't even transition into a liquid state. But in a world where the Earth's core are liquefied, we'd witness the worst consequences, starting with major and mass volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and tidal waves. Every major hotspot would be in danger, and the ring of fire would be a non-stop fountain of lava spewing out. Cool material from the upper layers sinks down to the core and vice versa. With a liquid and incredibly unstable core, this process would be much faster. Every major city and town by the coast would be washed away by tidal waves, and all the volcanoes erupting will blacken the sky with ash and smoke. This would temporarily block the sunlight from entering our atmosphere and eventually force anything flying in the air to remain on the ground. The lands we currently live on would feel like ice breaking away from a glacier and floating off. Many dormant volcanoes would wake up from their slumber and spew out their morning lava all over the place. The ground formation and structure would change permanently. Magma from the bottom of the ocean trenches would find its way up to the surface and change the currents in the oceans. The Arctic Ocean and Antarctica would melt away and add to the rise of water levels all around the northern and southern hemispheres, and eventually, the world. Wildlife on land wouldn't be able to flourish, and all the greenery would disappear. Marine life would have to find a way to escape the changes in the ocean temperature. The world economy would crash as an international emergency would be declared to try and figure out a way to stop this. But humanity would barely make it alive and would have to strive to continue existing. Well, of course, something like this will never happen. 
But if the Earth's core cooled down, then we wouldn't have massive volcanic eruptions. No devastating earthquakes nor tidal waves. In fact, none of these things would happen since they require energy to function. The continents would stop moving and changing. Sounds cool, right? Mm, no. This means that the magnetic field protecting our planet would disappear, which would make us extremely vulnerable to cosmic radiation, as well as asteroids and meteorites. The sun's rays will feel even more intense than usual, which will make it extremely unsafe for anyone to go outside. The heat produced in the core is responsible for recycling the carbon that goes back to the surface. Now, recycling would stop altogether. Carbon is an essential part of carbon dioxide that plants need to survive. So all the trees and plants on the surface and in the water would stop growing and wouldn't be able to produce oxygen for the rest of the world. With cosmic radiation and lack of oxygen, humans would have to live in bunkers with artificial ventilation systems. The Earth's surface would become a no-go zone and start to resemble Mars. With nothing to power the Earth from the inside, it'd begin to dry up and crumble internally. Much of the Earth's surface is made out of oxygen, so without it, we would eventually see something like major sinkholes around the world. Sinkholes that can take down cities like New York and Paris, along with landslides in many cities and unstable landscapes all over the place. Every single city's infrastructure would eventually collapse and make the ground unwalkable. So even if you did live in an underground bunker, chances are the foundation wouldn't last and you'd be exposed to the cosmic radiation. But all of this can vanish in the blink of an eye if an asteroid comes falling down. Whether it's tiny or colossal, we would be seeing more of those than actual rain. Without a magnetic field, the Earth can't block any foreign object that flies through our atmosphere. If an asteroid the size of Rhode Island came falling down, the damage would be much more than with the Earth's core hot and running. With the ground as fragile as potato chips, the ripple effect would be much wider and cause more indirect destruction around us. The Earth would eventually collapse in on itself and break into pieces until it's lost its own gravitational energy. It'd end up being a bunch of rocks and pebbles floating around in the emptiness of space. But nothing like that will happen either. We're living fine with our solid hot Earth core. As long as it's doing okay, then we can keep on doing our thing.